Listeners, okay, hey there, welcome to the coast. I'm Carrie Champion, that's David Lloyd. The radio stations, David, locally, they were blasting the Lakers. Yeah. It was a rough day for me, so be kind during okay. today's show, okay? Okay, I will, okay. I promise. I I was going to say, thank goodness we have the NFL, but we're starting off with basketball, are we not? I got a quiz question for you. What's the hardest place for a road team to win in the NBA this season? Uh, up north. Oh, uh, well, then that's sort of, sort of west no. to here and east uh, to you. It's Denver. What? It's the Pepsi Center. Close. How about the Nugs, Carrie? They keep Nikola Jokic getting it done. Russ, feeling good. A little chair dancing pregame. And there's Jokic, the seven-footer, 24 years old. He is having a monster season. A little teardrop floater with one knee up. The guy is fourth in the NBA in player efficiency rating behind only Anthony Davis, the Greek freak, and James Harden knocking down a three there. He had 36 in this game, 10 boards, nine assists. Nuggets rolling up by 13 at halftime. Third quarter now. Here's where it gets interesting. Westbrook over there near the crowd, and there's a young fit, a young urchin, Popping him on the shooting elbow. What's going on? He would sit down, but Russ didn't really enjoy this, and I don't really blame him. He did have a word with the urchin's father, dad to dad. He hit me, uh, so I told his dad, you know, just be careful, man. You can't have your son just hitting, hitting random people. I don't know him. He don't know me, so uh, just let him know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, just got to control your kids. It's that simple. Control your kids, people. Fourth quarter, game tied, 97 apiece. Westbrook going long distance. So OKC takes a lead. But a minute later, back come the Nugs. Jamal Murray spotting up in the corner. And Denver's up by two. Later in the fourth, Jokic getting it to Murray and 27 puts it down. He had 20 in this game. The Nuggets win at 42 and 18. They're off to the best start in franchise history. Home record of 27 and 4, best in the NBA. And it's about this guy. To say that Jokic is a leader for the Nuggets would be a massive understatement. He leads the team in points, rebounds, assists, and steals. He'd be the first big man to average 20, 10, and 7 in over 50 years when Will Chamberlain did it twice in the mid 60s. Kerry? Hey, David, I knew it was Denver. I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. Okay. Celtics, Raptors. You know how I do it, right? All right. Kyrie and the Celtics on the road against the Raptors. 14 and 15 on the road this season. Last season, 28 and 13. Off the top, Kyrie puts out his right arm uh, while dribbling. He's caught for an offensive foul. He does not like it, as you can see, voicing his displeasure, among other things. Less than four minutes left in the second. Celtics down 18. Smart turns it over. There's Kawhi being elegant. It's an easy two. He could have been nasty with it. Celtics clearly struggling. Uh, 20 seconds, folks, and I want you to hear what this guy has to say. And this guy is someone who's frustrated with what's been going on with his team. He cannot understand how in the world they get to this point. So Nick Nurse wants a T. Does he get it? Yeah, uh-huh, he does. So let's pay attention to what Brad Stevens has to say. Oh, everybody saw it. All right, folks, third quarter, Raptors up 18. Kyle tosses a long pass to Kawhi, makes the basket underneath the hoop. I want to hear Kawhi laugh. That actually makes my day. Meanwhile, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that it's garbage time, and the Raptors are killing the Celtics. And they look as if they're disoriented. They don't know what's going on. Raptors win 118-95. Brad Stevens, how do you get your team under control here? The reality is, is that we're taking a lot of shortcuts and, and not being as solid as we have been in the past, um, in the last two games. You know, you can't do that against um, any team, uh, and certainly tonight um, they exposed us and played great. We have to be a lot more connected as a team. It's been a theme for a while. Brad talked about just defensively, you guys have been taking shortcuts. Um, so do you see that, and how do you guys fix things like that at this point in the season, do you feel like? I don't know. It's up to Brett. Marcus said that you guys aren't playing together. Is that a fair diagnosis? I mean, that's Marcus's opinion. So, Is it your respect opinion? it. 
Now, does that passive aggressive thing work? I wonder. I have someone here to help me out. Former NBA head coach Stan Van Gundy joining us here on the coast. The Raptors hand Boston, as you just saw, their worst loss of the season. Uh, we've watched this team unravel in terms of chemistry, coach. And I'm really curious as to what you think the issue is. Uh, this team was once considered the only real feasible threat to the champs, which would be Golden State. What is the problem here? Well, first of all, we have to consider the possibility that maybe they're just not as good as these other teams. Mm. Maybe Boston's not as good as Milwaukee, Toronto, Philadelphia right now. Those teams are all playing great. Their talent's at least as good as Boston's. So that's something that we've got to consider. Then the second thing is when we talk about a team not being connected, it's that everybody has their own ideas on how things should should be done. That's never going to work. Even if you're a guy who thinks you have a better idea, having everybody have different ideas will never work in terms of bringing a team together. All right, call me Captain Obvious, but I'm going to state what most people are saying outside looking in. Last year, they were fine without Kyrie. This year, Kyrie is really in the mix, um, and he's even admitted there's been some issues for him in terms of trying to make this all be cohesive. If you are a coach and you're listening to Kyrie, what he's saying on and off the court, do you, do you invest in a player like that in the future, or do you welcome a departure? Well, he's a great talent, and, and so I think he is somebody you want to invest in. But he's trying to learn how to do this, too, and, and how to lead. And it's a lot harder, obviously, than he thinks it was going to be. Like you said, there was a team that had a lot of success last year. They don't think they need to be taught by Kyrie Irving. Mm. This is the situation Kyrie wanted. He left Cleveland. He wanted his own team. It's time for him to step up and prove that he can lead a team to great success. They were in the conference finals a year ago. Can he lead them at least that far? That's the challenge to Kyrie yeah. Irving. How about that cliche, the grass is not always greener, right? A absolutely. You're looking over there and you're thinking that's what you want. Okay, you got it, my friend. Be better about it. Meanwhile, I have to ask you this. He says, talk to Brad Stevens. It's up to him. Do you think that this coach with this team, I mean, anything is possible, but can he really turn things around? Oh, absolutely. Brad's a great coach. Here's what needs to happen with the Celtics, in my opinion. They've got a lot of guys that want to speak out right now, a lot of guys voicing their opinions on what's wrong. Instead of trying to lead right now in this moment, they need to be followers, and they need to follow Brad Stevens. They need to listen to his message and execute what he wants done on the floor. That will bring them together. They have a leader. It's Brad Stevens. Listen to him. Well, then a better question. Will they listen to him in your experience? Well, I, I think that they can. Will they? We have about six weeks to find out, and you hope the looming playoffs will bring them together and they'll be able to put aside all this personal stuff and say, look, we've got a great coach. We're going to listen to him, and we're not going to care about anything about winning. They haven't shown that they could do that all year. We'll find out in the next six weeks. <laughs> we'll find out in the next six weeks. Also, Coach is hanging around. He's going to talk about the Lakers and what's been happening with that team. we got a good one for you tonight on ESPN. He is calling the game with his brother. I call them truth tellers. You don't want to miss that. All right, Kerry, to the uh, NFL now. And after all the turbulence in Pittsburgh this season, the GM, Kevin Colbert, made news when he backed his quarterback saying the rest of the team should listen to Ben Roethlisberger, that it was Ben and 52 kids. That obviously didn't go over well with almost everyone involved and seemed to make Antonio Brown's case for him about the dysfunction on the team. Today at the Combine, Colbert sort of walked back those comments. Yeah, I mean, the 52 kids uh, comment, if anybody was there for the entire 30 minutes of the interview, they understood what I was saying. And I first put myself first in the in the blame for the 9-6-1 and non-playoff season. So in referencing 52 kids, what I was referencing is Ben Roethlisberger is the only player on our roster that's won a Super Bowl. And I've had that conversation not only with Ben, I had that conversation with Marquise Pouncey. I had that conversation with Cam Hayward right after the season during our exit interviews. So that's something that really... Um, it, anytime I say anything in the media, I'm not afraid to say it to our players and probably have prior to that. Kevin Colbert at the Combine. So is our front office insider, Lou Riddick. And Lou, you hear Colbert there. Do you buy it? Does that take the sting out of what he said? What is it just an unfortunate choice of words? Well, it doesn't take the sting out of it for Antonio Brown. I think, look, m my point has been this. You have to have some awareness as to what is the mindset of the player in question here that we're all talking about, which is Antonio Brown, and how he is interpreting the way that he is being treated 
relative to what is obviously the unquestioned leader of that football team, Ben Roethlisberger? And is it necessary for you to, when you're speaking about the situation and speaking about Ben's stature in that organization, is it necessary to refer to the other players as kids, whether or not you mean it in the way that you're saying you mean it, which is harmless, and it's really you know representative of the fact that Ben has played in Super Bowls and the other guys have not. You may mean it that way, but there has to be some awareness as to how this player in question, meaning Antonio Brown, is feeling as though he's being treated. And, and it's just not, look, it, it, this is one of those things that you need to be conscious of when you're dealing with a guy like this, if in fact you really want him to still remain a part of your football team and be someone who's going to be happy with the way things are going. Antonio clearly is not. He is clearly someone who is taking offense to how he feels he is being treated and how he is being looked at relative to the unquestioned leader of the football team. And again, I'll say that over and over, Ben Roethlisberger. I just personally feel as though if I was in that position, I just don't necessarily feel as though if I was talking to the guys on my football team and referring to them as kids, relative to their experience. I just don't feel as though in this situation, it would have been prudent for me if I was in that situation to go ahead and refer to my football team as being 52 kids plus my quarterback. I just don't think that's very smart. But hey, look, they're the ones who have to deal with this now going forward. They've made their intentions known as far as what's going to happen with Antonio. Antonio's made his intentions known as far as what he wants to happen to him. And the sooner they can put that to bed, uh, you know, the quicker they can stop asking these questions. Kevin Colbert said also today that he's not going to trade Antonio Brown unless it makes sense for the Steelers. What's, what, what is he talking about? What's a deal that would make sense? What would they get back for Antonio Brown? Well, I, I think obviously they're not going to go ahead and trade away one of the most productive players over the past five or six years that we've ever seen in the history of this league at his position for peanuts. They're not going to just give him away and they're not going to send him somewhere that makes it you know, that's the best situation necessarily for Antonio and makes him the happiest. They're going to send him somewhere where they can get the most return on, you know, on their investment that they've already made in him. And what would that be? What would a satisfactory deal for them be? Obviously, they're going to look for as high a draft pick as possible. Obviously, they'd love to get a number one. Obviously, they'd love to get maybe a number two. It, it, it remains to be seen, though, as far as what pl- how teams are really valuing Antonio at this point from a draft pick compensation. And then to add on top of it, whether or not they really are inclined to want to extend his deal and give him more guaranteed money because of how he has conducted himself and how he has handled his exit out of Pittsburgh. So, look, I, I, I think it's going to be a little bit tougher of a, of a road for them to get the kind of return that they want based on how all these things have played out. And I wouldn't be shocked if it's one of those deals where you wind up sitting there going, that's all they got? Mm-hmm. That's what they got in return for him? Just because of all the drama and the circus that is surrounding this, because teams don't like that. They, they just don't. Although they could, there could be one, and it only takes just one, to go ahead and pony up and say, look, this is a guy who could make a difference for us. It remains to be seen if that's exactly what's going to happen, though. This is a historic franchise, and this is also one of the best wideouts in the game. It continues to be one of the intriguing storylines of this NFL offseason. Loretta giving us his insight from the NFL Combine there in Indianapolis. Coming up. Stay-